out at Highway 56, north of uh, McMinnville. They're having a vacation Bible school. It's three days. It starts tonight, Monday night, Tuesday night. And they asked me to speak to the adult class on Tuesday night. And it's about healing, healing. They got three things. Healing the mind, healing the body, healing the soul. And so, you know, now, we're to renew our mind. But God's teachings, it's just like medicine for the mind to set your thinking straight. Healing the body. Well, Jesus could do that from physical ailments. But there are physical benefits to living the way God wants you to live. But then healing the soul. That's most important, isn't it? You see, the soul lives on. Now, they've asked me to talk about healing the soul, but then they did this to me. <laughs> they want me to talk about that in terms of the story of the woman that was taken in adultery and brought to Christ. Say, Moses said we should stone her. What do you say? You know the story. Jesus just started writing on the ground. Kind of like he's, I'm just going to ignore you all. Just Well, they kept pressing him. And he said, well, let him that doesn't have a sin cast the first stone. And he went back to writing on the ground, and, and their conscience got to bothering them. And they all left. And Jesus looked up and said, well, neither do I condemn thee. Go sin no more. Let me read the story to you. Let me read the story to you. It's found in the book of John. John 7, it actually begins the last verse of chapter 7 and then the first 11 verses of John chapter 8. And every man went to his own house. And Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning he came again to the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and he said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted himself up and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Do you have the King James Version? That's from the King James Version. If you're reading the King James Version, you'll read that. It's just right in there. Part, it's part of the Bible. Just reading down through chapter 7 into 8. There's no indication that there's any problem with that. But in 1901, the American Standard Version was printed. And they'd done all this research and scholarship of all these ancient texts. And there was a troubling footnote about these verses. Here it is in the American Standard Version. Now, you know I use that a lot. But now here's the footnote. It said this. Most of the ancient authorities omit John 7, 53 through 8, 11. Those which contain it very much from each other. That's all they said. Well, that kind of makes you wonder, well, wait a minute. So, is something wrong with this passage? Well, there's more they could have said. 
Of course, it's hard to say a whole lot in just a footnote. I've got a commentary on the book of John written by David Light. And by the way, if things go well, he'll be speaking at Old Philadelphia during our gospel meeting in late September. We're still kind of watching for that. But, but you need to know David Light. Uh, David Light wrote a commentary on John, and, and he pointed something out. I didn't know about this passage. He said it began to appear in the ancient text in about the 5th century. So, if you know how that works, 1st century is when it's being written. That'd be about 400 years after the rest of the Bible's written. It begins to appear in the text. Well, should it be there? Okay, that's what they were talking about here. But... It was quoted earlier than that. You see, the ancient texts are not the only source we have for what ought to be in the Bible. Men reading the Bible, just like I do when I'm preaching and I quote from the Bible. Well, men were writing to each other and quoting the scriptures to each other. And they had found references to this story back as far as the second century. That's right after the close of the apostolic age. Now, People wonder, well, did John write it? Is this where it ought to be? Some texts have it in a different place. Man, listen, there are people that after they study all this, they get to wondering whether John wrote it and whether this is where it belongs in the Bible. But most of them that get through studying this out decide, look, even if we're not sure John wrote it, and even if we're not sure this is where it belongs, it needs to be in the Bible somewhere. Because there's enough evidence. In their language, they'll say, we're not sure it's authentic. but uh, uh, No, we're not sure it's genuine, but it's authentic. It needs to be in the Bible. And so this is where it's traditionally been, right there. Now, with that confidence we have in the passage, let's see what it teaches. Here's one of the reasons we know it ought to be there. It matches everything else we read in the Bible about Jesus. It says, every man went to his own house, and Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Remember, how, that's how it starts. Well, Jesus would be in Jerusalem teaching during the day, and then the evening he would leave, and we know he would go to the house of Mary and Martha at Bethany. And doing that, he would pass by the Mount of Olives. And that night, the, in which he was betrayed, he left that upper room and they went down that same path and they went to Gethsemane where Jesus prayed it says in Luke 2 39 and he came out and went as he was walked that he was known to the Mount of Olives so this fits what we know about Jesus from other passages now early in the morning he comes back to the temple he's teaching the people and teaching them and here the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman now she's taken in adultery okay now, we know the controversy over what Jesus taught about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And the role adultery has to play in all of that. And, and there are those, they'll say this, they're trying to find all kind of ways to kind of slide around what Jesus taught and it's not uncommon to people say that they'll just redefine adultery. Adultery means something else in the Bible than what we think it is. It's, it's just covenant breaking, some kind of ambiguous covenant breaking. Listen, we know what this adultery was, don't we? It's an act. She's caught in the very act. We're going to, I'm going to show you just a minute. I may not bring this up again, but you watch what we read. It's going to identify it as laying with a man. Oh, we, we know what she was doing. We know what adultery is. And don't be fooled when people try to redefine words to avoid or to bring their own ideas into it. Don't be fooled by that. We know what adultery is. And she's caught in the very act of adultery. And they said, Moses commanded us that she should be stoned. This they said, tempting him that they might accuse him. Listen, they're not interested in what the law says. They want to discredit Jesus before those to whom he is teaching. This whole thing has the, the appearance of a setup, doesn't it? And so here they brought her to Jesus and they're accusing him. But you see what the law said. Where was the man? Brought the woman. What happened to the man? 
Now, they're not doing what the law said when they brought this woman to Jesus. It says in Deuteronomy 22, 22 through 24, if a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman. So thou shalt put away this evil from Israel. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto a husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out to the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones if they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife. So thou shalt put away evil from among you. So you can tell by that. You know what adultery is. Don't, don't, don't try to confuse that. But what happened to the man? Doesn't say anything about him, does it? So they bring this woman to him. And the law of Moses said to be stoned. Um, well, they brought it to the wrong person. This, that's not the role Jesus was playing here. They had a whole system, the Jews did, set up about how to handle this. There were judges they were to bring such accusations to. There was a time in Luke chapter 12, 13 through 14, where they brought a man to Jesus, and a man said, Speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Now listen, if you've got a dispute about an inheritance and how it ought to be divided, you know, there's ways to deal with that. You can't expect the preacher to do all that. Now, and, and Jesus told them, he said, man, who made me a judge or divider over you? They shouldn't have brought her to Jesus. The reason they did it was to try to discredit him. And he could have answered in this way. But instead, he took his finger and wrote on the ground. Now, it says in italics in the King James Version, as though he heard them not. Now, that's not what it says in the text, but that's kind of an interpretation there in the King James Version. But that makes sense, doesn't it? So I'm just going to ignore them and just, just start writing something. You ever had somebody just kind of ignore you? Just pick up and start doing something different, like they're not even going to hear you. That's what Jesus is doing. And in the meantime, the tension builds, doesn't it? And so they press him, saying, what are we going to do? And that's when he said, he that's without sin among you, let him cast a first stone. Psalm 57 and verse 6. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. They got out there and set a trap for Jesus, and you know what he did? He sprung it on them. Now, what about them? And then he just starts right on the ground. Now they're the ones that made a mess, and they've got to answer themselves. You see, if Jesus had said, okay, go out and stone her, that would have been a violation of the law. Even that had been a violation of Romans law because you could not put someone to death in Jerusalem in those days without the appealing to the Romans. They're the ones that granted the Jews permission to put to death. Now you do it. What are you going to think? Is that going to discredit them before the people to ignore Moses' law? Are they going to break Roman law? And so he sprung their own trap on them. Now it says in Deuteronomy, here's something they may have forgotten. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, 5 through 7, and I won't read all of this, but notice that part in yellow where it says, the hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death. Had they thought about that? The ones that were to cast the first stone were the witnesses. That'd keep you from bearing false witness, wouldn't it? Now, here's what Jesus said. He said, well, wait, we phrase it, let him that hath not sinned cast the first stone, but he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And now their conscience got to bothering them. That doesn't mean they were all guilty of adultery, but they were guilty of something, and they knew it. They knew their own sin, and in the silence, they got to thinking about that. And their own conscience 
They knew. They knew what they had done. They knew they were being unjust to this woman. They knew why they were there trying to entrap Jesus. And now they were remembering. But, but you know, I've sinned too. And the oldest ones seem to think of that first. They're the first ones to leave. And it got down to the youngest, and then, then they left too. And so she's left alone. Now the crowd that Jesus was teaching may have still been there, but Jesus and the woman are there. Those accusers are gone. Where are your accusers? Well, they're gone. They're gone. And then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Does your conscience convict you? You think about it now. Yeah. Wouldn't you love to hear Jesus say to whatever you're thinking about, well, I don't condemn you. I mean, others may know about this and they condemn you. And you feel bad about it yourself. But Jesus says, well, but I don't. I don't condemn you. Wouldn't that be wonderful to hear that? Look, we're reading the book of Romans chapter 8. And in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Put that on your conscience. It might bother you. You said, I'm not going to let it bother me. Others are condemning you. Well, I don't. And if Jesus isn't going to condemn you, what difference does it make? Who else condemns you? But notice what Jesus said. He didn't say, well, that's all right if you want to commit adultery. He didn't say that. He said, neither do I condemn you. Return to your adultery. He didn't say that. He knew she was guilty. He said, neither do I condemn you. Sin no more. We want forgiveness for our sins. then we turn from our sins. You don't continue in sin. Look, Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, Jesus doesn't say, oh, go ahead. You, you can commit adultery. I won't condemn you. That's not what he said. He said, neither do I condemn you sin no more and with that blessing of the Lord knowing he's going to forgive don't you want to live them pure before him and not get into that mess again sin no more and would we cast the first stone would, would we do what if you'd been there when him without sin cast the first stone, well, I don't, I don't like to think I would have been so foolish as to cast it. I don't think I would have but we have all learned, haven't we? We know it is so much easier for us to see the faults in others than it is to ourselves. So let me put this on your conscience if you'll let me do this. Listen. Would you cast the stone at those accusers? See, it's pretty easy to condemn, aren't they? They came trapping Jesus. They caught this woman they weren't following. And then we can, oh, those accusers. But, but what about us now? What about those accusers? Would we cast a stone at them? Thou art inexcusable, old man, whoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest dost the same thing. Here, here's a lesson to remember. That no, there's no justification for sin. Before you start pointing your finger at that sinner, I wasn't pointing at anybody there. Okay, before you start pointing a finger at a sinner, think about your own sin. Consider that. There's something better than stoning a sinner to death. I'll tell you what's better. And that's restoring a sinner. And so we read in Galatians 6 and verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. 
Don't ever comb through the Bible trying to say, well, it'll be all right if I see it. It'll be. No, don't ever do that. But do. But when you're thinking of a sinner and someone's in a fault, don't, don't throw the book at them. Don't throw the book at them. Do like Jesus did and seek to restore them. They can get forgiveness. And they don't have to live in this sin. They don't have to continue in it. That, that's better than stoning them. And so there's the example of, of Jesus for us. As I think about this idea of healing, and since I'm going to be talking about healing the soul, I thought of that song we sang, Once from my poor sin sick soul. Christ did every burden roll. Now I walk redeemed and whole, hand in hand with Jesus. You see, here's God. God sees everything. He knows every He knows every thought. But God's not up there trying to say, Aha, I got them. I don't have to get them in heaven. I'm just sending them to hell. That's not what God's doing. God is up there seeing everything, and he's doing everything he can to save. But I want them saved. I want them redeemed. I want them restored. I want to heal their soul. And I want them with me in eternity. And my son died for them. So I can do this. I can send them forth without condemnation. There's no reason to leave this worship with any condemnation. You can be baptized into Christ and have a new birth. And, and you can leave all your sins behind. God says, I'll remember them no more. And that's the blessing that we have here. You can be saved the way they were in the book of Acts. And so with that, I'm going to extend the invitation for this song if you want to respond this morning.